kidding. Just kidding. All right, let's get, get a big round of applause for our next story by Jeff Kloon. <laughs> Jeff Kloon. Hello, everyone. I just want to like to say thanks again for that amazing story. That was incredible. <laughs> I will not try to follow it, I'll just tell you my story. Uh, in my home, what we had, as many as you probably did, is just lots of time. And to help us fill the time, what my parents did is they bought me Mr. Wizard's cookbook. Which, I don't know if any of you remember, but it was these pages of experiments of what you could do with like ingredients around the house that would do cool things. And so my dad opened up to page one, and I told him to up the ante about quadruple the ingredient list. And he mixed the baking soda and vinegar, and as the foam spilled out over the kitchen table and onto the floor and started running towards the expensive carpet, I was hooked. <laughs> but of course, I didn't flip to page two. For some reason, I wanted to be the person discovering the magic. So I enlisted my brother, who is here tonight, and I said, let's mix and match everything we can find in the house to create magic <laughs> potions. And so Tabasco would go in with Windex, and ammonia and bleach would come together with balsamic vinegar. And inevitably, nothing interesting would happen. <laughs> to my great surprise, I would just get green slime every single time. And eventually I said, aha, well, maybe it's a potion, so we should apply it to animals. And to my great embarrassment, we, we just did horrible things to the toads around my house. Now, I'm repentant. I've been a vegetarian for like 21 years, and it's because of that. <laughs> because <laughs> I feel really bad. But in any case, every time I dunk these poor little toads in these potions, nothing would happen. So eventually my brother wisely said to me, it's not magic, you're just kind of slightly you know, creating toxic chemicals for these potions. Nothing's going to happen. You know, at which point my bubble just went, pop. And that was it. That was the end of my discovery. Until I discovered fire. <laughs> which is... <laughs> So one time I'm walking through the swamp with my friend. Somebody's burning a pile of leaves, and they've left it smoldering, and we see a little aerosol can nearby. And so we throw it in the fire, and we kind of run away, and we wait. And I kid you not, that thing took off like a NASA rocket. And I don't mean like a just vip. I mean like slow burning, steady through the sky. <laughs> it had like two feet of flame coming out of the bottom. It was incredible, and it just stopped in a tree, and I was, once again, I was hooked. And so, you know, a couple days later, my friend and I were like, well, what should we do? And I said, well, you know, let's, let's, I have an idea. And so I enlisted my brother once again and my friend, and we built, in my parents' nice, beautiful house, we built a fire in the first floor, uh, you know, fireplace. But we didn't light it. We just, like, crumpled up newspaper, logs, the whole lot. And then my plan was to try to light it by pouring liquid flame down from the second-story chimney. So to do that, I went into the Costco closet where we have cheese doodles to last two apocalypses because you never know. And in there is this industrial strength uh, hairspray in a gallon jug. I pour that into a cup, go up to the roof, I light out the, the thing on fire, and you've got this blue flame dancing around in the top of the cup. And I look down into the black depths of the chimney, and I start pouring, and it just goes out. And I was like, well, that's a shame. The fire didn't make the transition. So I said, all right, here, here's what I'll do. I'll start pouring, and I get a nice, steady pour going. I look down into the darkness, and I light it. And it lit up, and I swear to you, it was the most beautiful thing I have ever seen <laughs> in my life. It was this blue, twisting rope of liquid fire. You've never seen anything like it. And at some point, it must have hit the side of the chimney, and then... <laughs> And I'm stumbling around on a relatively angled roof of my house, just wondering what just happened to me. And then I reach up to wipe the soot away from my eyes and realize that I don't have eyebrows anymore. <laughs> and then I went down and looked in the mirror, and I realized not only did I not have eyebrows, but all of the bangs, which in those hair metal days were quite ambitious, had completely burned back off of my face. And to my complete shock, my parents, the showering for like half an hour did not prevent my parents from seeing the fact that I had burned off all of my eyebrows and all of my hair. So I was grounded for a while and put off a fire, but it didn't leave me. So a year or two later, a, fr a different friend of mine was around and said, you know, what are we going to do at home? We have nothing going on. And I said, well, I saw this one thing where this aerosol can took off like a rocket. Let's do that again. 
So we went into the basement of my home and we filled up our backpack with as many aerosol cans as we could find. And we headed down to this island in this lake and we built this huge fire and we threw one of them in there and then we ran as fast as we can and we did, literally just dove into the grass expecting like die hard horizon level fire blowing up <laughs> behind us. And that didn't happen, so we kind of wiggled around, and we're looking through our eyes at this fire, waiting for this thing to blow up. You know, and 30 seconds passes, and then 60 seconds pass, and then one minute, and then five minutes, and at about 10 minutes, you're starting to think, okay, it's not going to work. But you realize you've trapped yourself. You can't stand up, because at any minute, you're going to be torn to rib my shrapnel if this thing <laughs> blows up in your face. So we're sitting there looking, and literally 20, 30, 40, boom! And there's this ball of fire, really cool, and it sounds like Napoleon lit off a cannon in your bedroom. It was the biggest sound I'd ever heard in my entire life, and it rolled across the lake, and it was, we were amazed. So we go over to like check out what had happened in the fire, and we find the aerosol can, and that little tiny, it was totally unharmed, but that little tiny metal thing is missing at the end. And we're like, wow, that could have just gone anywhere and like totally you know, dismembered us. So we looked at each other, we go, let's do it again. <laughs> So we throw another can in the fire, we go, we wander, we dive, we lay down, we look, and this time it is a beautiful mushroom cloud of flame. I kid you not, like Dr. Strangelove style on this island, just rises up and rolling over, it's incredible. Then we throw a third, and this time it melts the nozzle off and creates like a flamethrower, like just somebody sitting there... And I actually have evidence, like the bush 15 feet away is half singed in charcoal the next day when I show my friends the story. And so eventually that we're sick and tired of waiting this 30 minute increment for each one of these things to go off. So my friend, friend goes, I have an idea. He goes, let's heat it up a little bit, like preheat it before we go. <laughs> So we throw a can in the fire. He takes another aerosol can. He lights it on fire, and he's holding the flamethrower. We're both looking at this thing, and he gets up to about 10 seconds, and we drop it, and we run. And to his credit, it only took like 15 minutes to blow up this time, <laughs> which was incredible. So the second time, we held it for longer, get it down to seven minutes, and then we're out of, we're out of cans. We're down to the two big cans and one of those little quarter cans or half cans they've got. All right, I'll finish up. And... Uh, <laughs> And oblivious to the physics of this situation, he says, let's both hold our, our, our aerosol cans on the fire, which we do. And we're sitting there, and it's like three seconds. And I just roll onto my back and look up at the sky, knowing I had done it again. And I feel the eyebrows are gone. The bangs are gone. And this time I look up, and my vision is completely clouded over. I can't see a thing. And my friend goes, dude, I'm blind. <laughs> Now, as you can tell, I don't have a cane, so I recovered. But in hindsight, as I think about all this, what I realized is that I was a scientist the whole time and I was trying to explore. And I just started a position as a full-time scientist. And the first thing that I did as a faculty member at the University of Wyoming is start a club for kids to be mad scientists, to do this in a safe environment. So here is my takeaway for all of you, which is that amongst you might not be animal sadists or you have people that have a shockingly low amount of self-preservation, but instead, they may be scientists yearning to explore and discover. So for the sake of all the eyebrows and toads in your neighborhood, help them discover that. Thank you. Thank you.